And in 1955, she won the title of Miss Pinup Girl of the World. Whoa. Yeah, I've never been anything of the world or even like the county. <laughs> Little of the world. You know what? I bet you if you applied yourself, you could Not be even the of city. the county. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to be known at county level. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's a t-shirt, right? I, oh, oh, yeah. No. I just want to be known at the county level. That is so fucked up. It's fucked up. So fucked up. It is just so damn fucked up. That's fucked up. She doesn't even go here, Fallon. That's me. You just <laughs> think you can come and go on your whimsy? <laughs> on your whimsy? <laughs> on my whimsy? Oh my gosh, I'm going to be so good today. Watch this. Hey, you guys. Welcome back to That's So Fucked Up a respectful and compassionate comedy podcast about cults, crime, and other things that make you say, ugh, that's so fucked up. We are your hosts. I'm Ashley Love Richards. And I'm Fallon Mori. And today we are talking about bangs, seam stockings, six inch heels, Brrr. Anybody? Anybody? S- sounds hot. I don't know. Betty Page. Betty Page. Oh, I'm so excited. It is one minute to recording and we have introduced the show ourselves and the topic. <sighs> and I just have to say, go me. And it's probably that kind of stuck up shit that I've been saying that has chased one listener away at least you know i was gonna say have you ever seen those memes for the coffee shops where it's like come get the worst cup of coffee that one person on yelp has ever had or something like on their sign yes (laughs) okay i'm going to embrace that you guys literally somebody or literally i yes literally but also i meant to say recently (laughs) somebody left me a little love note that said it, well, it has Z's to, you know, represent snoring <laughs> and said, host has become way too full of herself because nothing bothers me. I've been racking my brain thinking, what is it? Did you say, Ashley? Why do, why do people think you're better than them all the sudden or that you think that's what you think, even though that's not what you think? And maybe it's because of things like me going, shit, go me. I killed that intro. Yeah, you know, so egotistical of you, Ashley. Oh, my God. It's unappealing. I Come understand. listen to the most stuck up person that one particular listener has ever heard. <laughs> and then I was thinking about it and I was like, maybe it's because I put my face on the cover. Lots of people have their face on the cover. After four years. I literally have been trying to think about what makes me seem in somebody's mind stuck up. But I guess it's just because I constantly talk about how I'm like super cool and super pretty and how much everybody loves me. And now I have like a really amazing, fantastical life with just like, like beautiful relationships all the time all around. Yeah. I do talk about that a lot. And like, you do. And like, and <laughs> yeah. And like the money vault you have where you swim around in gold coins like Scrooge McDuck. I mean, yeah. pretty egotistical. Ash. I guess I should stop so like, Ashley, if you <laughs> were further in therapy, you wouldn't spend three minutes talking about one person who left a mean comment. But you know what, you guys? Actually, that gives me a really good fucking segue. So... <laughs> Believe it or not, one of the things I talk about most in therapy is um, why aren't I enough? Anything I do is never enough. And, you know, it's it's usually not that. But, hey, Vanderpump Rules fans, it's not about the pasta. Am I right? It's never about the pasta. Like when, you know, some shit bothers you and you're like, mm, why did that bitch try to eat my pasta? And you realize it's because you didn't get enough love as a child. You know, there, it's always the deeper thing. You know what I'm talking about? No, I, no. 
<laughs> You're lost? I'm a little lost. Is it because I threw in Vanderpump Rules? I have no idea what okay, that show it's is. It's because there's this one time where James Kennedy says to his friend Lala, who they've had like feelings, and she tries to eat some of his girlfriend's pasta, and he gets mad, and then he's like, it's not about the pasta, Lala. It's not about the pasta. <laughs> And it's just really representative about how you get into a fight with your friend about uh, chairs or whatever. And it, it's not about chairs. It's about the fact that she said some shit to you six months ago that you didn't fucking say anything about that has been stewing a little bit. And now she says she hates that chair. And you're like, well, I fucking love that chair, you cunt. It worms its way in there and finally it hits like the right spot. And then you're like, no, I fucking hate strawberries, you asshole. Yeah, but it's not about strawberries. It's not about the strawberries or the pasta or the chair. That's the point. I got you. Where were we? Well, my point was that it's not about like some dumb comment about somebody uh, saying, oh, she thinks her too good for herself. At the end of the day, it's me going into like a tailspin of like, did I say something crazy? Does everybody hate me? Oh, my God. Am I the worst? Should I just quit? It all happens very fast. All of those thoughts. And then I think about other things. But anyways. Anyways. It's not about the pasta is my point. No, it's about Betty Page. It's about Betty Page. And I'm excited because the three things you mentioned at the top of the episode are literally the only things I know about Betty Page. Bangs, stockings, and six-inch heels? Yeah, pretty much. So I'm excited. She's kind of known for those things. So that's why I said that. Yeah. Kind of a skilled storyteller like that. <laughs> go home. We can all go home. It's over. She had those three. She had bangs and uh, that's it. So Betty is and was and probably will always be a total cultural phenomenon and icon. I have a giant Betty Page crush. I have done two photo shoots, one that I did by myself because I think really the reason is because I'm controlling and think that I can do <laughs> everything best. And sometimes that's right and sometimes it's not. But anyways, I did one because she did a lot of bikini shoots and then I did another. I told you, I did a boudoir shoot. Yeah. With a girl in a studio. Yeah. And I took naked pictures. Oh. But not like you can't see anything. You know, they're very, very tasteful. You guys join my OnlyFans for $40 a month. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. They're just for me. And Fallon. <laughs> but, but they're, you guys, they're not for me. I don't. No, but it's just, it was really fun to, you know, just to like get creative with another woman. And actually something that really, really inspired me is that some of Betty's most beautiful pictures were done with her and a woman photographer named Bunny Yeager, who was also a pinup model ah. who took photos of herself. So also my photo shoot was inspired by the fact that she took pictures of herself. So I was like, well, so can I. So there can you go. I. So I've been inspired by Betty's just like beauty and amazingness to do some creative things. You know, doing like these little photo shoots lately has been a fun creative outlet for me. And I cut bangs because Betty. I know. And luckily, I don't look like I had a mental health breakdown, even though I did and may still be currently having one depending <laughs> on the release of this. <laughs> It all depends where in our uh, time stream we happen to be. <laughs> yep. But I had a mental <laughs> breakdown. I cut, I got bangs. I didn't cut them myself. I went to the hairdresser and it worked out. So anyways, they're like, yes, Ashley, go. Okay, you guys, here I go. So Betty, <laughs> she's just fucking awesome. Whew. All right. So she was born in Nashville, Tennessee on April 22nd, 1923. Wow. Ow, right? Her parents were Walter Roy Page and Edna May Pirtle. She was the second of six children, three boys and three girls. And uh, Betty herself said that 
her mom never wanted girls and Hmm. that was made pretty apparent. So her father was a mechanic and it was the Great Depression. So their family really struggled. In her younger years, they traveled around the country trying to find economic stability. And Betty said they lived on beans, potatoes, and macaroni. Mm. Dinner of champions. Okay. You know what, bitch? Like, I know that was out of necessity, but Fallon, hmm. I love beans and potatoes and macaroni, so you go fuck yourself, all right? It's delicious. Okay. You're so angry about your crappy food. I love all those things. I just don't love them in combination is what I'm saying. Okay. Well, I mean, I actually, okay, just like side note, I love barbecue, but I don't like meat that much. I just like that (laughs) there's a ton of different sides. It's so fun. (laughs) It's like so many sides. Yeah. Fuck the meat. Anywho, I just had to make you laugh before I say something that greatly uh, depresses you. So you guys actually right now would be a good time for me to give a trigger warning. There is sexual assault more than once in this story. Mm. Um, Child essay. It's a couple times. So I'll just give little trigger warnings before those happen and definitely skip about 30 seconds ahead right now if you do not want to hear about how sick her fucking dad was. So she uh, said that she, quote, let him molest her for 10 cents to go to the movie theater. And this was when she was 13. And she said, but he didn't penetrate me like he later did my sisters. She also said that he would fuck anything he could get his hands on, including, and then she listed like three or four different animals. So, um, sick fuck. I was not expecting animals. I know. I know. I was not expecting animal assault within three minutes of (laughs) the real story starting. People might have come back already. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. We didn't detail. No, but just... It wasn't like me on the one episode just blurting out (laughs) (laughs) terrible details. Whoa, 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 settle down. (laughs) So, yeah. uh, Also, he was convicted for car theft and spent two years in prison in Atlanta. And Betty was forced to care for her younger siblings, which... I mean, according to my great grandma, who was born in like 1919, she said that when she was five or six, her mom handed her a baby and was like, this one's for you to take care of. And when I was 20 and fucking probably kind of buzzed or let's let's be honest, outright hammered, you know, sitting there talking to my grandma because I lived with her for like six years and I was highly alcoholic pretty much that whole time so i feel bad that i didn't like listen to her fucking stories more but i'm also like you were an alcoholic in your 20s like (laughs) cut yourself some slack but yeah she would you know tell me shit about growing up in the fucking depression and stuff and i think that was probably pretty common yeah for people to just be like um there's six of you kids and i'm overwhelmed and yeah this case dad's gone so it's just it's wild and as we know um from what we've learned through fucking christian patriarchy bullshit what is it called parentification parentification is done in these often these big quiverful families where there's a fuck ton of kids hello duggars 17 19 whatever fucking kids and counting it's like it's, it's now when I watch clips of shit, sometimes I'm so mind blown with what I see. It's like Jessa, 11, is in charge of Haley, Josiah, Jeffrey, Junior, Jenna. And like, it's like she's fucking 11, bro. Doesn't she, who's her? Who's taking care of her? Anyways, it's so anyway. Also, dude. Yeah. What is up? Shout out to our production assistant, Danita. She's amazing. She's been helping me with getting episodes posted and stuff. And shout out to our researchers and our editing team. Y'all are the fucking tits. Like we can't just say that we could not do that without you. But Danita fucking drops on me the other day. Oh, I bought my car from Josh Duggar. 
in the little tiny office where he was doing all of that bad stuff with CSAM. What? And I was like, I'm sorry, you way to bury the fucking lead. I've talked to you like how many times? <laughs> like <laughs> speaking of a guy doing terrible things too. Betty Page. Yeah. ADHD. It's ADHD. <laughs> H A D A. Okay. So, right. Parentification. Parentific. Parentification. Yeah, it's bad. Yeah. So, Betty's just so much. It's just like, it's very sad. It's so much mm-hmm. trauma. So, her dad, shit. Her mom, like, outwardly does not like her. And she's having to care for her, uh, well, four younger siblings because she's the second of six. And her parents divorced when she was 10. And her mom took two jobs to try to support the kids. She was a hairdresser during the day and worked with laundry at night. But ultimately, she couldn't care for all six children and sent Betty and her two sisters to a Protestant orphanage for one year that Betty said was ran by three really mean old ladies who had them scrubbing floors all the time. Why? Like, you, I feel like that's the classic fucking orphanage story. Annie, yes. Oliver. Why are, why are they always mean to the children in the orphanages? What the fuck, man? Because they didn't, they were probably miserable people. It's not like they got into the orphanage business in 1928 because they loved children. They got into the orphanage business during the Depression because they were like, I need somewhere to live because otherwise it's a box or a shanty town. I'm really glad I didn't have coffee in my <laughs> fucking mouth when you said they didn't get into that during the Depression. Because <sighs> they yeah. probably were like, live in this shanty town and eat beans out of a can, or you get to sleep in this warm building with a bunch of kids and get free food like well and it was a protestant orphanage so i'm not saying that like i'm not saying anything i'm just gonna keep talking so Paige noted in an interview that quote when i started menstruating at 13 i thought i was dying because she never taught me anything about that in reference to her mom which it just breaks my heart like she she like outwardly hates her then sends her to an orphanage then brings her back but like doesn't obviously communicate with her about life yeah and to like think that you're dying that's just so sad and despite her difficult childhood though betty excelled in school and this fucking bummed me out too. She said her dream was to be valedictorian because the valedictorian would get a full scholarship to Vanderbilt University. But she was beat out by a quarter of a point. (gasps) Oh, what a shame. I know. So she got salutatorian, but fucking fuck second place, right? Because she just got a $100 scholarship to Peabody College for teachers, which I just thought was really fucking offensive. I mean, I get that it was the time, but it's like, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's the time. So when women can only be teachers and secretaries. So if the first place person was a dude, which I'm going to presume it was, do we really think that she actually got beat out by a quarter point or do they just rig it that way because they weren't about to give a girl (gasps) the scholarship to Vanderbilt and a boy a teacher's college scholarship, right? I feel like that. It just it just seems like the second place is set up for women. Yeah, exactly. Like it seems like I'm sure they got there and were like, well, this isn't worked out the way it usually does for us. So Yeah, this is nineteen forty, so women's rights aren't super Yeah. Great. I gotta question that. Yeah. So that's some fucking horseshit. But she was incredibly smart and talented. She was the program director of the drama club, secretary treasurer of student council, co-editor of the school newspaper and yearbook, and voted girl most likely to succeed, which um, I got to say, if people are still talking about you 101 years after you were born and it's not slowing down anytime soon i think they nailed it girl yeah i don't think they're talking about you know barry smith or whatever that got the vanderbilt scholarship yeah, fuck barry <laughs> or whatever that's not Fucking, really the same guys fuck you barry smith no i know <laughs> but just you know the who he represents <laughs> so um 
after high school, Betty enrolled at Peabody College and initially studied education, but guess what? She wasn't into that. So she started studying acting in hopes of becoming an actress. And in 1944, she graduated with a Bachelor of Arts degree. She met her first husband, total piece of shit, Billy Neal, while she was still in high school. He was a sports hero around town who was two years older than her. And that just fucking sounds, oh, the fucking, the, like, the ex-college or the fucking high school jock, like, who's still the cool guy around town two years later. Because he's fat sitting on his couch and, like, watching his old high school football videos. Yeah. <laughs> That's Bill, the vibe that I get from Billy, especially because he was an abusive fuck. He was drafted into the army in September of 1942, and Betty said that he kept bugging her to get married, which I'm like, that's called coercion. Nobody should bother, bother you. you into getting married. That should be an enthusiastic yes, in my opinion. So they got married and she said that it happened within like five minutes. And right after she thought, what have I done? So what his abuse happened within five minutes? No, just them like deciding to getting married and go. It's I don't like they didn't have like a big, nice wedding. It was like, oh, OK, you keep bugging me. So like, fuck. All right. I guess I'll marry you. And then it was like. And we're married, you know. I watched a documentary, which made me really sad that she wouldn't be featured in it. Her face, you know, and we'll get into this later, but she disappeared from the public eye for a long time. And when she came back, she wouldn't let anybody see her after a while because she like had concerns about her weight and just like did doesn't look like she used to because of course she doesn't and just people are fucking mean you know so she yeah. just I mean I don't know I, I not that I don't think to my knowledge it's not that like she exposed her face and people are like monster and then she never <laughs> came back but it just sounded like it was in her later years she was not comfortable with appearing in public because yeah that just made me sad. But she did narrate the documentary. So a lot of this was coming from her firsthand. So they initially lived in San Francisco, where Betty got her first modeling job as she would model like furs for clients and stuff. And as all women uh, were required to do, she worked at the secretary factory. <laughs> do they make secretaries there? It's just, that's like, that was like, you had to be a teacher or a secretary. It seems like that was all that was available. Just go sit at a desk and type things. Yeah, which is why she really liked modeling. She was like, it's way better than fucking banging your hands into a keyboard <laughs> for eight hours a day. Like, sure, I'll take off my clothes. I agree, Betty, but they frown on that at my work. <laughs> Well, tell them to lighten up. No. <laughs> that's no, that's why we have rules in place because <laughs> it should not be sexually loose around the workplace, right? Yes, mm. I agree. So, anywho, <laughs> started thinking about Lizzo, and then I was like, Ashley, <laughs> stay on topic. So, this is fucking typical. Betty said that she was heartbroken when she failed her first screen test in LA because she was on the studio lot and some gross ass dude that she just said she was like disgusted by and had no interest in came up and asked her to dinner and she declined him and he said you'll be sorry for that. And then he was the fucking at the head of the table for her screen test. Ugh. And she said in an interview, I don't mind sleeping with someone to get ahead, but I'm not going to sleep with everyone. <laughs> well, good for her. I love her because she's so in a time, which is all throughout history, but especially at this time, she's so like sexually free. Yeah. She's like, I just never minded taking my clothes off. And she gets religious later. She's like, uh, you know, Adam and Eve were like, not a direct quote, naked as fuck in the Garden of Eden. That's true. She goes, so I don't think God has a problem with nudity. <laughs> I was like, yes, girl. That's right. So she said that when she went back to San Francisco, she gained a lot of weight because she was really depressed about 
not, you know, succeeding in LA. And her sister came to her and told her that her landlord had cussed her out and accused her of property damage. So Betty went to confront him and she said that he just came the fuck at her and started like beating her in the head. So her sister Goldie cracked him in the head with a bottle and then Betty had to be the representative or whatever because uh, Goldie was not 21. So Betty had to get a suspended sentence and pay a $10 fine. And there was a picture of her and that asshole in the newspaper that said, girl tenant bashes landlord. <laughs> that just makes her sound like a girl badass. Tenant? Girl tenant. She doesn't have a name. It gave me like girl boss vibes. Girl boss vibes. Girl, girl tenant. Boss. Or like that newspapers will go to like any length to avoid saying the woman's name that's not like somehow related to the man's title they'll be like the wife of mr so-and-so who is a doctor and you'd be like you can't say you know his wife dr cheryl say her name right like i've seen so many so many journalists bend over backwards to avoid saying the name of a woman if it's as like unrelated to a man well as we all know Vaginas are evil, and <laughs> we must protect everyone from them at all costs. <laughs> Don't name the vagina, it'll get you. <laughs> <laughs> Which we're going to see, actually, how in the 50s they're like straight up just like, vaginas are evil, because I was going to say there wasn't any dicks around, but that's not going to have any context yet. So just wait. So in 1947, Betty filed for divorce from Billy Neal. Because she said that when he returned from war, he was very different and he had become a, quote, a jealous maniac. And he accused her of sleeping with all the sailors in San Francisco. So, I mean, she would be have been very busy. Very. Yeah. And Betty was like, what fascinates her to a lot of people about her to this day is that she was like absolutely just so adorable and cute, like the girl next door. And then also just like fucking bondage queen. Yeah. Just so she just kind of always embodied like both of those things at once. She's very like clean cut. She didn't smoke. She didn't drink. She said she wouldn't date a guy who smoked because it was disgusting. She would not have been sleeping around with all the sailors in San Francisco as a married woman. That's what I'm trying to say. Like she just, she had a lot of right. like pretty intense morals and values, it seemed. And one night before she divorces him, she said that he had a knife to her throat and threatened to kill her if she divorced him. But she divorced him anyways because she's a badass and Good for was you, like, Betty, mm, fuck you. So in New York, while she was looking for acting jobs, she was supporting herself as a secretary. And days after she started working at the American Bread Company, something happened that was atrocious. So please go ahead and skip forward about a minute. Okay. So she says that one night she was walking alone and um, she was feeling lonely and a nice looking guy approached her on the street and said, would you like to go dancing? And she was like, yeah, sure. So she got in the car with him and there was a couple in the front seat, which will always make a woman feel safer. And she said they stopped at a red light and two more guys got into the car. Then they went a little bit further and two more guys got into the car. She said that they then arrived some abandoned place and all five men forced her to give oral sex. She said that she was on her period to try to avoid being, um, you know, raped in the other manner. And um, she said that they basically like left her for dead behind this school. Or Wow. Yeah. Mm. I mean, talk about fucking complex trauma you know like jesus christ this is so many fucking things that she's been through yeah like you know this is right after her fucking ex-husband like threatens to kill her it's just right it's so much so after this she was obviously fucking terrified and returned home to nashville where she worked with the 
L and N Railwood for a few weeks, but shortly after their return to New Hold York. On. I think you need to go back because you called it a Railwood, and I think it's probably a railroad. Words are hard. I just, I didn't want, <laughs> there's no way to edit that. <laughs> <laughs> so... It's a railroad, you guys. She was working at the L and N Railroad. And I, I said something else wrong too, so we'll say that again. Within a few weeks, she had returned to New York and got a job as a secretary again. Okay. I, I got through that. You got I, it. I said that whole sentence and <laughs> you you clocked what it meant. So I got you. We're going. We're we're moving. So because, you know, Billy hadn't already done enough with threatening her with a knife. And then, you know, Betty hadn't already been through enough with the assault that followed. Billy shows up one night and she's like single in an apartment and is threatening to kill her. But a neighbor comes out and is like, what's going on? And her ex-husband, Billy Neal, fucking slashes this dude in the face instead. What? And later, when she was encouraged to not be a fucking divorced loser and like be with a man, she got back together with Billy for a little bit. And that was because of the church, because we'll get into that. Wow. She got back together with Billy for a little bit. And um, he almost choked her to death. So he's a giant flaming piece of shit. And we hate Billy yeah. so much. Fuck you, Billy. And then also she later in life ends up following Billy Graham, who's another really Ugh. shitty Billy. He's a evangelist. And oh, what? Crazy. Not a great dude. Are you serious? Get out. Wait, super like racist and misogynist. And, like a televangelist. Is he a televangelist? Was he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't go too deep down the Billy Graham rabbit hole, but um, we've got two Billys in this story, and they both suck dick. So she says that shortly after that, she met the, quote, love of her life, Carlos Garcia, who took her dancing all the time and taught her Aww. all kinds of dance and she fucking loved dancing. But then one night his wife showed up super angry. Yeah. She had uh. no idea he was married. And she said that after that, she'd never been so down. Aww. And that's after a lot of other fucking really fucked up stuff happened. And at this point in her life, she's not even 30 and she's been through all of this stuff. Yeah, she's wow. 27. <laughs> God, the world's great place, you guys. Everything's fine. Aww. It's it's fine. It it's fine. It's fine. Okay, what? I'm broken. Okay. All right. So I lean Ford from, you know, Ford models. So they're like the biggest modeling agency. Yeah. Told Betty that she wouldn't make a good model and was quote too hippie, which means like too big in the hips. Yeah, we don't want models to have hips or breasts we prefer models to be completely flat no womanly features please no womanly features not that you know breasts and hips are what make or do not make a woman no you guys that's that's the point i don't mean no womanly features but it's really more about the whole you're only capable of modeling if you're skinny. Yeah. You know, heroin chic was cool before it was cool. You know what I'm saying, you guys? There was a time when, like, Marilyn Monroe's, mm -hmm. you know, she was curvy and people were like, yeah, they were into it. But maybe that was fleeting. I don't know. But, yeah, she was told by this rude Ford lady, you're not it. But you know what? She was like the most it ever, as you know. Yes. So in 1950, as she was walking along the shore of Coney Island, she met Jerry Tibbs, a Brooklyn officer and amateur photographer. Look, you guys, 99 out of 100 times it turned out great for Betty. There's, of course, there's more. But I would just say nowadays... When you hear amateur photographer, red flag. Yeah. Okay, you guys? I'm just saying. No. No. Um, no. Yeah. Yeah. To me, I just feel like that's usually a dude who wants to get girls in their lingerie. Or just naked. That's what 
amateur photographer gives me the most or like amateur artistic photographer means i definitely want to take pictures of you naked yeah it's not naked pictures it's artsy right yeah so ladies (laughs) you know when you're on tinder if it says amateur photog in the (laughs) bio like i'd say um left right swipe left if it's a no i have no idea i've never used it's a swipe dating no. app oh that's right you've been married for like a while Ten thousand years dating apps are <laughs> i'm really glad that i'm not on them so he gives betty his card and says you would make a great pinup model and offers to help her make her first pinup portfolio free of charge if he could photograph her And I feel like this would be really offensive, but also he was super right. So Uh, (laughs) he suggested that she get bangs to prevent light reflecting off of her high forehead, (laughs) which she did have like kind of a high forehead, but it's like rude, but also bangs became her like signature thing because she fucking rocked the hell out of them, you know, so I feel like he called it, but also I'd be like, excuse me about my forehead tips. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she cut her own bangs, which, you know, nowadays cutting your own bangs and amateur photographers like sketchy waters, you guys. But she did a great job and she looked gorgeous, obviously. And the bangs became an integral part of her look. And she started professionally modeling at the age of 27. But she said that people assumed that she was like 22 and she just never corrected them. I wouldn't. Why? She's like, well, you think what you want. I personally love to correct people when they're like, are you 30 something? And I'd be like, 42 bitch, but thank you. Like, I really love to tell people my actual age. Well, she probably knew that people are fucking misogynist. And well, if she's trying to be a model. I clearly am not trying <laughs> to be a supermodel. You're not model. trying to be a pinup model? She wasn't a supermodel. She was a pinup model. Stop well, it. Get well, it right. she's a model and she's super. And so I'm calling she's her super. that. Yeah. So tips introduce Betty to camera clubs, which were formed in the late 40s to get around laws restricting nude photo production. And they were, you know, in existence to promote artistic there photography it is. artistic photography aka but also, naked a lot of them were you know fronts for making porno which betty did not do Mm -mm. she said as a part of being in the camera club a lot of times they would go on like weekend field trips and go to a beach or something and spend the day up there and it would be like four models and about 30 photographers whoa which sounds fucking terrifying men and women or mostly men photographers mostly men oh yeah that would scare me i don't like those odds Yeah. yeah no but um She said that everyone was always polite and courteous and that if she ever felt anything was even like slightly sketchy that she would leave, which surprised me that that whole crowd was apparently polite and courteous. I'm sure there were the fucking sleazeballs. But I'm sure it was just a bunch of like camera nerds that are like, look, I just want to take a bunch of pictures. Like, I don't I don't really care about the girl there. I literally just want to take photographs. Or both, right? I mean, a little call maybe. So she was by far the most popular model. If they were saying, oh, this weekend we're going here and they'd list the models. If Betty was on the call sheet, it'd for sure be a packed shoot. Mm. And one photographer that they interviewed in this documentary said that, you know, with other models, he'd have to be like, okay, can you tilt your head up a little bit? And then, you know, look down to the left where with Betty, he'd be like rage, joy, nostalgia. And that she would just like immediately put her entire body into like expressing this emotion. And you can really see this in her pictures. Like I don't just like fangirl super hardcore because she's like hot as fuck. Like her pictures are amazing. Just like the way she moves her body, you can tell that that yeah. she's having a great fucking time and that, yeah, that she's just like putting her whole body into it. And yeah, like if you just I just Googled her and there's ones where like she has this look on her face like she is like a cat almost. And she's like she's got like a whip in her hand and she like her whole body is like hunched up. But then there's ones where she's just like super joyful and she's like leaning in like you just told her the funniest joke ever, which is like 
it's probably not very natural for most people. No, but people said that you basically couldn't take a bad picture of Betty. I was like, I wish you could say the same for old Ash Dog. (laughs) I get in front of the camera. I'm like, I don't know what to do with my hands. (laughs) You guys can't see that because there's no video. Hey, let us know. If that is something that would really tickle y'all's fancy, if we sometimes released video, hit us up. Let us know. Um, So anywho, uh, also, she made all of her own bikinis and most of her own lingerie, which is really impressive because also if you look at her pictures, her bikinis are fucking rad. And women were wearing full fucking like girdle swimsuits at this time and and bikini. (laughs) Betty was making... Like itty bitty beach bikinis. They were probably rocking them in like Europe, you know, or something. But she she was like, yeah, that was not done here. But get this, because everybody's the worst. A couple in Greenwich Village one time had her bring like all of her outfits and specifically all of her bikinis. They were like, yeah, bring all the bikinis you've made. And then she said that they had her change a bunch of times and she was like confused, like, why are you guys taking so many different outfit changes? And then they took her designs and the pictures they took of her modeling those designs and started manufacturing the swimwear and selling it. (gasps) What? Ugh. And she said, I didn't sue them or anything. I'm guessing suing people is not cheap or easy. Well, and I'm sure at that time, like, can you imagine being a woman in 19... like 50 something going to a lawyer, probably a male lawyer going, oh, help, this couple stole all of my hand sewn bikini designs. Like, take me seriously. And they'd have been like, what? Like, that's not the world we live in. Come on in in here. Come listen to this story. (laughs) Nowadays, somebody did that to where you'd have 3 million people on Instagram flagging that couple down and telling them to, Well, she fucking died, you know, pretty fucking penniless and now she's Mm. one of like the richest dead celebrities ever which really fucking pisses me off (laughs) that people profited off of her her entire fucking life and she did not So she skyrocketed to fame after being published in a variety of magazines, including Robert Harrison's magazine. Apparently he was a big wig at the time. And from 1951 to 1957, Betty posed for photographer Irving Claw quite often. She modeled for mail order photos and videos with pinup and BDSM themes. Ooh. And this led to Betty becoming the first famous bondage model. Now, what's super interesting about all of the BDSM is it's only women and it's not naked because Mm. they had super strict laws around pornography at the time and like being lewd and indecent. So if there was nudity or if it was men and women, then that would be porn. But they were able to kind of skirt that by making BDSM, Ah. but just with women in lingerie. Mm, that's hotter anyway (laughs) honestly it is so like (laughs) nailed it and but betty said that she was like completely acting in all of these scenes she said that she was never into that kind of stuff in her like personal life but she is hilarious in this interview she's got to be in her 80s and she just mentions fucking all the time she's like and he was a great lover and then we were together and he wasn't having sex with me and (laughs) oh i thought literally like Betty Page in her 80s was using the word fucking and I was going to be like wow go no, Betty. but she was just like talking about it a lot you know about how he was a great lover and how this man was not sleeping with her and <laughs> how she slept with this dude though and that was fine and <laughs> I love her attitudes. Claw also used Paige in silent black and white 8mm and 16mm specialty films that were made for clients' specific requests. And bespoke pornography. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In the documentary, you see like her fucking dressed as like a dog, essentially, in like a leather 
dog costume. No kink shaming here. But she said that they just like couldn't stop laughing. Like so <laughs> in, in, in these pictures, it looks very serious. You know, it's like, oh, leather BDSM. Rah. But she was like, I could not take this seriously. <laughs> Having a job like that, like what is it today? Today it's a uh, butterfly covered in ice cream for this guy in Cincinnati. And he wants you to crawl around on the ground. Like, I can't. <laughs> what a weird <laughs> job. <laughs> but she dug it. Like, you know, she said it was better than fucking being a secretary. Uh, that's true. Again, no shade at being a secretary. It just was not her jam. So some of the themes included elaborate leather costumes, bondage with ropes and whatnot, you know, spanking, domination, and sometimes even abduction so it got pretty got pretty fucking kinky that's for sure she said that she was only scared one time oh wow and it's it's a woman in the pictures with her who's like tying her up and this was on a client's request i think i don't know but irving claw told her that it was the pictures he sold most of ever of anybody but she said that they had her tied up from the hands and the ankles mm. and took her like six inches off the ground Ooh. and she was like yelling like get me down this hurts but they kept taking like pictures from different angles oh. and then they like finally let her down but she said that that was the only time that she ever felt scared which one time is too fucking Benny. Yeah. Later, they wanted her to testify against Irving Claw during these decency hearings. And she was like, I'm just not going to like say that he's a terrible person because that was not my fucking experience. Yeah. With him. She said, quote, usually every other Saturday, he had a session for four or five hours. In order to get paid, you had to do an hour of bondage. And that was the only reason I did it. I never had any inkling along that line. I don't really disapprove of it. I think you can do your your own thing as long as you're not hurting anybody else end quote is it ugh, yeah that's like one of my life's mottos that's is my like, like life your philosophy just don't hurt people yes she's such a queen mm. ugh, queen and um well that's why she's also known as the queen of bondage the queen of curves and the dark angel who calls her that that sounds lame the dark angel that sounds yeah. like her like motorcycle name. <laughs> well, they've made a lot of comics and stuff after her. Obviously, she's inspired every fucking kind of pop fandom, whatever. I'm sure there is available, you know, including comic books. Because did you know those are super sexual? Bro. Yes. I did not know that until we were editing the comic book category for HexaQuest. And like I had never looked into comics in my life. And I was like, what the fuck is going on in these books that like there's all this fucking going on? I thought these books were for kids. And like, especially if you read some of the Batman storylines and stuff, they're super dark and super awful. Dude. No, and it's sexual. And yeah, it's I was tripped the fuck out. I was like, <laughs> this is not what I thought would. I don't know, you guys. Life trips me out. If I turn over my kids, you know, kids hexaquest category and the f number five question is who did batman have sex with in the 1967 edition i'm gonna be mad <laughs> so you obviously know the answer to that no i don't I just <laughs> <made one> of... <laughs> no and it's for prude ass parents like you <laughs> that we keep questions like that out come on i just pimped hex hexaquest on the podcast no, my kids actually love it i'm disturbed by the sexual <laughs> themes in the comic books i don't i don't you guys i'm wearing a robe right now and i shit you not not on purpose but instinctively she's I clutching her robe. my robe and closed it <laughs> i'm just i'm not about that i wish she had no, a set of pearls you. she could clutch next oh, i literally clutched my robe closed <laughs> And it's like an animal print from my angle, like an old school style looking. Like, well, you rope. guys, so perfect for clutching. I did <laughs> a Betty Page themed shoot with a, a girl who does boudoir photography. And one of the ones I did is Betty is in this robe that's mm -hmm. the, basically like the one I'm wearing. And 
everything's covered. But it's- yeah, actually, I'm sad, though, because we didn't have a stool. We kind of needed like an ottoman to like make the ra- the robe drape out. So actually, the pictures with the robe didn't turn out. But it's one of the most comfortable things I've ever bought. So yeah, this is definitely wildly different than your recording, like the recording robe, I call it your colorless recording sweater. You guys... <laughs> My recording robe is a mauve. <laughs> Colorless. Um, like maybe like a mauve gray, brownish. Um, very comfy, like dude style sweater, I would say. And let me tell you, this robe is it's a robe still. And my poor boyfriend is like, ooh, hot robe, because it's like sexier than the other robe that I wear. <laughs> right I'll just tell everyone it was probably a good, what, four months of recording in my early host co-hosting days before I saw Ashley in anything except that robe. And I was like, oh, my God, is that a T-shirt? Like, <laughs> first time I saw you. You know what, you guys? <laughs> I'm going to pull the depression card. And shame Fallon for shaming me. Shame me. You know, sometimes haven't you guys ever just worn a robe for six months because you were sad? Come on, holler at me, guys. I think after three months, the robe is wearing you. Now I'm less sad, so I'm wearing a more fun robe. I know. I love it. Anyway. Oh, you guys, what I was going to say earlier, and then I ADHD outed, um, because all of this is kind of hardcore bummer that we talk about all the time and because I have been struggling with some mental health stuff for fucking god damn it feels like literally like half a year probably I don't know but it's been a while and I know what's up my discord peeps that a lot of you know us cultlings All the TSF universe people either do struggle with something ourselves or we have a loved one who struggles Mm -hmm. with mental health. So I'm starting a monthly health segment, monthly mental health segment where I'm going to be interviewing experts and all kinds of people about trauma and complex trauma and different kinds of therapies and uh, different healing modalities. And we're going to we're going to like get educated and learn you guys and and grow and heal together so that's going to be really fun Okay, now I'm going to keep going. In 1953, Betty sought acting through classes at the Herbert Berghoff studio, and she actually <laughs> ended up getting several roles on stage and in television. What? What? I never laugh at the right time. <laughs> you never. I'll make funny ass jokes and you like laugh in your head, apparently. <laughs> and then I'm just saying normal things, I think. <laughs> For some reason, my brain was like convinced that you were going to say like the Herbert Berbert school of <laughs> acting and it just made me laugh and then you finished it differently. But my brain was already down that path so far that I was... She in- went to the hibbledy bibbledy <laughs> school of acting. I'm sorry. Okay, keep going. I'm fine. <sighs> oh, you guys, <sighs> it is 751 Mountain and 951 Eastern right now. So if we sound like we've lost our minds we have it's because we have because it's <laughs> late okay but i'm i'm like mm, we're yeah i'm gonna don't worry we're almost there okay so she got several stage roles and roles in tv she was even in a film or two and in 1955 she won the title of Miss Pinup Girl of the World. Whoa. Yeah, I've never been anything of the world or even like the county. <laughs> <laughs> little of the world you know what i bet you if you applied yourself you could Not be the of city. the county <laughs> <laughs> uh, this i is... just want to be known at county level you know what i'm saying <laughs> <laughs> that's a t-shirt right I, oh no. yeah i just want to be known at the county level <laughs> so i mentioned bunny yeager earlier right 
that was the the photographer photographer mm-hmm. yeah and she started shooting with bunny around 1955 and they submitted a photo of betty like next to kneeling next to a little christmas tree with a santa hat on oh. and she's winking and you can see her titties and she's putting a, a ornament on the tree and it's just so classic betty just like so sexy but also just like so cute and innocent and her and bunny got fucking uh centerfold january 1955 which was one of the first centerfolds for playboy and yeah wow i would have loved if the answer was that they did it like for artistic reasons as well i'd love that really but when they were asked like why did you guys collaborate on these like super risque pictures they were just like well because that's what sold like yes because dudes with dicks will pay top dollar for that yeah so they just really fucking killed it together bunny said that betty told her that she was 24 but she knew that she was like 32 (laughs) she was just like okay Whatever you say, baby. You do you. Yeah. (laughs) And Betty said that she felt most comfortable posing nude with women, which isn't weird because Bunny said that as a female photographer, it's a lot easier to get women to take their clothes off for you because you're not as threatening as a dude. Like, obviously. I've done three different boudoir shoots and like... The last one was the first time I think I got mostly like you could see stuff, but they were all with women. And you're just like some other woman is like, oh, just take your top off and lay on that bed. You're like, all right. Sounds like a good idea. Like it doesn't feel threatening. You're just like, OK, I mean, I was that's like, what Hi, we're going nice to do now. Nice to meet you. Do you mind if I show you is my it cool if I take my panties <laughs> off? <laughs> What's up, girl? (laughs) Yeah. So Betty was named the girl with the perfect figure with her photos appearing on everything from playing cards to record album. And again, what pisses me off is that people just made so much fucking money off of her and royalties to her were never a thing. In 1957, at the age of 35, Betty left New York in the height of her popularity. Totally unexplained just disappeared disappeared she said that she thought she was getting too old to model and that people were probably tired of seeing her which is fucking cuckoo because people could not get enough of her Mm. and i think probably more so is that she said that one time at a photo shoot these photographers got her drunk and she said she never drank and they took photos of her and betty was pretty fucking comfortable just like beaver out you know bush was in back then beaver out bush in yeah like she was not an inhibited woman Mm -hmm. and she said that these pictures that she didn't even fucking remember taking made her uncomfortable and they were sold of course against her want and i think that's why she i personally like it spooked her a little bit like i I cross like a line i said yeah i I think so you know because also remember betty's had like a lot of fucking trauma from men right um of course so i could imagine something like that being like you know what fuck this i am out i'm gonna go yeah i'm gonna get out of here now i'm gonna move to florida and play it safe said nobody ever because florida Except for Betty did. She did move to Florida. And um, she was, you know, in that same year of 1957, gave expert guidance to the FBI in regard to the production of flagellation and bondage pictures. And flagellation, Hmm. looked it up for y'all, is flogging, beating, or whipping. So her photos were found to have violated sexual taboos and... It was it was like her and Irvin mm-hmm. Irving Claw that they were investigating. It was kind of hard to tell who they were pinning it more on, but definitely her and Irving. They were like, "Fuck you guys." Mostly Irving though, actually, because he was the one producing it and 
producing a lot of it with a lot of people. But her photos were found to have violated sexual taboos and eventually invoked a United States committee investigation. But that's because this fucking senator called models like Paige and their photographers, quote, degrading and a bad influence. But this fucker was planning on running for presidency. So he was just trying to fucking right. find something to go hard on, you know? Right. So never, ever heard of that happening before. What? Get out of here. A political tactic. (laughs) So he formed a subcommittee on juvenile delinquency to investigate the influences these photos and films had. And apparently that's when he found the case of Clarence Grimm, who had claimed that his son's suicide was influenced by Betty. He testified that his son, Kenneth, uh, sorry guys, trigger warning, that his son, Kenneth, was found hanging by his knees and neck and apparently had been like looking at a photo of Betty. But yeah, I don't think that's Betty's fault, guys. Yeah. Senator, crazy. I can tell you the results of your study are that boys masturbate when they get into their teen years and that has happened before Betty was ever born and will continue to happen long after Betty has passed. Yeah. It's like, you know, whatever. I'm not going to go there. Just like, don't blame the artists. Okay. You guys, and unless it's like Marilyn Manson or Jared Leto, I blame P Diddy them for a lot of things. Michael Jackson. Um, God, the list keeps growing. Oh God. But anywho, so This is fucking crazy to me. The investigation left Irving Claw in ruins and led to an early death um, because they destroyed most of his fucking life's work. Oh, Betty said that he was always super respectful. Like she really liked working with him. Like he wasn't some smut peddler, you know, and just... Like, it's crazy. I guess at the time, postal inspectors could open people's mail to make sure that there wasn't lewd or obscene material being sent through the mail. Like, just... Well, we did hear about that case in, you know, the one the one case during our MK Ultra episode where some girl's dad was arrested because they had found him shipping things through the mail that were illegal. So I wonder if that's like, you know, the same oh, kind of deal. if it was porn? Yeah. Well, it was. It was. Oh, it was porn. It, that's it wasn't right. porn. It was CSAM. But like, I'm wondering oh, if that, that because of those rules... That's how it was like found. Probably. I mean, maybe. Yeah. You know, it's almost as if back then they were really, really trying to control people's bodily autonomy. And then like. I'm so glad it's better now. Yeah. Weirdly, like 60 years later, that's not happening. Oh, that's what, what? happened. So when you I got sp- swept up in a when you spin world. 360 degrees, you end up at the same same spot. It's hey, amazing. Hey, there we are. There we are. <laughs> Wild. Yeah. On New Year's Eve, 1959, after an argument with Betty's second husband Armand, she found herself drawn to a church. And uh, she had previously gotten a knee injury and the doctor said, we're going to have to have surgery and you're going to have to stop modeling. And Betty said that she was laying in bed one day feeling really sad about it. And she heard a big voice. No surprise. It was God. Um, Tell her, (laughs) Betty, move your leg. You can do it. And lo and behold, uh, she could. And she did. So... She became a born-again Christian and got super into that. Interesting. She immersed herself in Bible studies and ended up serving as a counselor for the Billy Graham Crusade. Oh, Betty, no. Over time, she attended three Bible colleges. Um, She was really into it. And on October 10th, 1963... Betty and Armand divorced because, in her words, all they had in common was sex and hamburgers. (laughs) 
I mean, but if you're going to have two things in common, that sounds like I mean, a good arrangement to me. a pretty winning combo, right? I can do but everything else myself, but like... Six football hamburgers. Six Fuck football. Six and football. Six and hamburgers. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, But Betty wanted to become a Christian missionary, but the church was like, um, you're divorced and that's like basically being Satan. You're basically worse than a murderer and we don't want you we prefer it when women stay with their abusive partners actually did you have an abusive ex-husband get back with him what are you doing go back i mean come on betty obvious choice yeah um which you know q she fucking tries again with billy billy and he tries to fucking murder her and uh she Mm. pieces out again real quick luckily she eventually started working full-time for billy graham and married a Harry Lear on Valentine's Day, 1966. During her marriage to Harry, her mental health began to deteriorate. Mm. And in January of 1972, on a ministry retreat in Boca Raton, she ran through the retreat with a pistol. Uh, oh, I, I don't know the exact situation, but it was scary. She lost it. She said wow. that she had been hearing the voices of God and the devil and angels for days, and it broke her mind. Oh. She was later diagnosed with acute schizophrenia, so mm. that makes sense. In April of that same year, she forced Harry and his children to pray to Jesus at knife point. Oh, after this, she was committed to Jackson Memorial for four months and later ended up voluntarily recommitting herself and was under suicide watch. Oh. In 1978, Lear decided to separate from Betty and they divorced because she was a danger to herself and others. Yeah. She relocated to California to be closer to her brother but had fallen into a depression that was marked with violent mood swings. And then she has another with a landlady. It's three landlords that she gets into crazy shit with. But during an altercation with a landlady, Betty attacked her with a knife and spent 20 months in Patton State Hospital in San Bernardino. I'm guessing Second- she was probably having like a episode or something i think like a, yeah oh, i, I so don't think sad. she was violent in her like when mm. she was in her right mind you know yeah. a second altercation occurred with another landlady in 1982 and details vary but it's said that betty repeatedly stabbed this woman and managed to cut off one of her fingers and slice her face pretty good oh, wow but the victim did survive oh my gosh Betty was found innocent by reason of insanity and spent another 10 years at Patton State Hospital. When she was released in 1992, she was like amazed to find that she had become this huge cultural icon. She was like, what the fuck? Like I'm famous. Like she had no idea. Wow. And a million people out there putting her face on stuff, making tons Tons of money. money. Mm -hmm. You know, there was... Obviously, this renewed interest that had resurged and was focusing on her pinup and lingerie modeling. Her photos were almost entirely in the public domain. And as a result, several Betty related products were released like without I'm sure her, you know. In 1993, Betty did a phone interview with Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, telling host Robin Leach that she had been unaware of her popularity and stated that she was penniless and infamous. Aww. Entertainment Tonight ran a segment on her in which time she was living in a group home in Los Angeles. Aww. I know. <sighs> ah! She deserved better. So much better. And <clears throat> she didn't allow any current pictures to be shown of her because of weight concerns. Aww. The majority of her final years were spent in a one bedroom apartment where she would read the Bible, listen to Christian and country music and watch old Westerns on TV occasionally browsing secondhand clothing stores. I'm going to cry. I... (laughs) Her agent, Mark Rosler, informed the public that Betty was hospitalized in critical condition on December 6, 2008. And it's not actually 
really clear whether she died from a heart attack or pneumonia. But on December 11th, 2008, her family agreed to dis- discontinue life support and she passed away at the age of 85. Huh. And, uh, come on. Um, and yeah, like I said, she's like one of the fucking richest dead celebrities, which pisses me off. A historical marker commemorating her life was erected in her birth town of Nashville in 2023. Are you kidding me? Like last year? Get it together, but like, good job, I guess, now. Um, <laughs> and in a 1998 interview, Betty commented on her career saying, quote, I never thought it was shameful. I felt normal. It's just that it was much better than pounding a typewriter eight hours a day. Good for her. Mic drop. She had so many ups and downs. It wasn't all like a total downer. I mean, like there's a lot of sad stuff, but it sounds like she still found a way to have a lot of like ups in her life too. Yeah. I mean, she was just like incredibly fucking strong and resilient and like gave so few fucks about other people. At like the time of the 1900s where they expected women to give all the fucks about. That is such a full circle moment. Each other. That is such a full circle moment because in the beginning I was talking about how one person said one thing and I just have way too many fucks to give about it. Yeah. And I just want to be more like Betty and have no fucks. Even when she was like older and super Christian, she was like, I don't know, dog. Like I was just fucking naked and like having fun. And I think that's fine. Maybe that's our new T-shirt. Be like Betty (laughs) with like a little bangs and just like little sunglasses. (laughs) Yes. Honestly, I'm sure that already exists on Etsy. But you know what? We'll just like throw TSFU on there. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. (laughs) If it doesn't exist, though, we could make it. But I'm so sure it does because she is um, a massive part of popular culture. Yeah. And, you know, it's a fucking wild story beginning to end. I heard her story years ago, years ago on a podcast. What? And then I forgot about it. And then I started getting into taking pictures as a creative hobby. And then I found what me like that's so unique. I found Betty's work and was super inspired by it. Yeah, I'm definitely the only person, obviously, that that happened to. No, but I think it's good to see that, like, you know, the person you see on the picture, that's like one tiny snapshot moment of their life. And that's how everyone thinks of them. But like nobody thinks about all the stuff that happened to them to get there. And you're like, oh, you know, I just want to be like Betty, Betty Page. And it's like, but do you know how much grueling, intense life she had to live to get to stand on that beach rock and take that picture? Like, it's cool. That's why I always say I would never trade places with somebody else even if they look like they have the perfect glamorous problem free life hi i'm pretty sure that doesn't exist if you do like let me know because i just like i'd love to interview you and know what that's like and how you got there if your life is like (laughs) barbie in the first day that you see barbie in the movie like where you float from the house and your feet don't touch the ground. Tell us that. Please tell me about that. I'm like second day Barbie, maybe third day Barbie. Like, I don't know, something like that. Flat footed Barbie. (laughs) I'm Midge. (laughs) Is that the pregnant one? Weird Barbie. (laughs) I I love Kate McKinnon. So actually, you guys, March was Women's History Month, but that's right. I'm only sometimes good at doing things when they're relevant and I really wanted to do Betty's episode during Women's History Month because obviously she's a fucking badass lady of history but then sometimes most of the time the schedule changes (laughs) that's what happens So, um, I don't know. I'm super glad that we told this story, though, because, yeah, I think I love her and I'm glad. It's important to show people, like, about what they don't know about, I think. Like, I didn't know anything about Betty, so I'm glad to hear it. So easy through pictures and social media to be like, oh, man, people's lives are so glamorous and cool. You just have no fucking idea. That's the message of the day. I'm going to get real Mr. Rogers neighborhood on y'all. Be kind to each other. Yeah, she's putting her loafers on right now. She's changing her robe for a sweater. (laughs) You know, you guys, you just never know what anybody's going through. 
And I'm saying this to myself too, as I think about, you know, the person that I like tailed and honked at the other day because they were being a dick. Okay. But you know, really though, you just never, you never know. So, you know, let's all just like try to be nice to somebody today. Just like one person, just like open a door or something. It'll feel good. And then maybe they'll pass it on. Do it. We dare you. Do it. Double dog dare you. (laughs) You know, I'm weird about double dare now with the whole Nickelodeon shit. Yeah, I wasn't saying it like that. No, I know. And now I just made it all bummer at the end. God damn it. Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, won't you be my neighbor? Love you guys. That was real as fuck, Fallon. And was it real fucked up? It was real fucked up, but we love Betty. Real fucked up. Betty wasn't fucked up, but like the other shit was real fucked up. Well, yeah. And mental illness is a bitch. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And we love you guys. Good night. Good night. We're so bad at hanging up the phone. So, bye. <laughs> bye. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you hang up. No, you. I'm going to count to three. Bum, 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 bum. That's fucked up. I'm so fucked up. Can't you see? It's just really fucked. That's fucked up.